Um, as Gary said, you know, we have a national local government association which covers all councils, but the East of England local government association is separate. It works very closely with the national LGA, um, but it is separate and it just covers the 50 councils in the East of England, which obviously takes in Fenland, in Cambridgeshire, um, but neighbouring um, councils of Suffolk, um, Norfolk, and um, Essex, Hertfordshire, um, Bedfordshire and Essex. So that's essentially um, the East of England. And um, we're a small organisation and we actually play host to the Strategic Migration Partnership, which many of you in the room will probably be familiar with. It's one of the 12 um, UK partnerships um, funded by the Home Office. Um, it was set up in 2000. Um, it's a partnership of local authorities, statutory providers, and, um, and the voluntary sector. I mean, it was set up initially to help coordinate the dispersal and accommodation and support from asylum seekers, but as time has gone on, it's taken on um, more of a role. And from 2007, their remit has extended to include wider migration agenda, agenda and more recently about um, vulnerable ad adults and children. And, um, you know, Rachel's been um, name-checked quite often today, um, Rachel Heathcock, who's part of that team and has been working on the Migrant um, Workers Project with um, Mick McMurray. And so what I'm going to talk about very quickly um, now is just... To give a quick overview of what we're doing in the east of England, um, firstly, then talk a little bit about the Home Office Indicators of Integration Framework, and finally some regional initiatives to improve community cohesion. You don't have to finish by three o'clock on the Oh, right, well... I, I can be flexible. Oh, so. there you are. <laughs> so when he starts waving paper at me, you can yeah, um, yeah. remind watch, him of watch that. Watch for the paper. Watch for the paper. So, um, so just, this is just a few statistics, really, um, about the East of England in terms of the numbers of asylum seekers, refugees, unaccompanied asylum seeking children, and former um, unaccompanied asylum seeking children. And the data on EU nationals, although we believe that this is much lower due to um, under-reporting. So that's just a, a brief overview. Then in terms of what local authorities are councils in the east of England are considering in their work with migrant communities, we've heard a lot about this today in terms of different issues. Um, so obviously um, language and the language of the different migrant communities is a big barrier to, um, to integration in many communities. Um, and um, as we've seen from some of the references that Anita made, you know, where a school you know, was not on top of the emerging language issues as different groups um, enter in. And it's a real challenge for local authorities to keep up to speed and up to date on what is happening. And in fact, you know, the last um, but one presentation that we heard on the um, impact of migration in the Fenland study is a real, you know, that has got to be the best practice, hasn't it? All, you know, if every council did what Fenland did and actually went out and actually started to commission research to the issues that face their communities, we would be living and working in a far more responsive, um, you know, society. Unfortunately, they are a shining beacon, um, you know, and, and what we in the East of England LGA need to do is to demonstrate and show to other councils that by working in partnership and using the resources of the academic institutions that we all know and love, that we could do this in, you know, for Thetford, we could do this for Ipswich, we could do this for Basildon. And it might not be about migrant workers, but it might be about the issues that are really important to those communities. Um, so I think it's a really, you know, I just wanted to... Um, to make that connection, that all these issues, employment, housing, education, health and integration, are all issues that councils are considering in relation to their migrant communities. Um, but how well they know about them is going to really depend on how closely they work in partnership with their communities and the, um, and the voluntary sector and the stakeholders who um, are across them. So, 
In terms of, I wanted to reference um, the Home Office Integrations of Indicators Framework because um, I suppose the reason for doing that is that sometimes in big organisations like councils, it's quite useful to have a framework in order to, to measure how effective we are. Um, you know, I've been around in local government long enough to have seen initiatives come and go and come and go, and they can become very sort of flavour of the month. But actually, what we need to do is to use frameworks, I often think, particularly in the public sector, to actually measure how effective we are. Um, Gary's referred to this, um, and also um, I can't, uh, Barbara, uh, Margaret has referred to the inability to connect into the public sector services, particularly health, local government. And I think this um, indicator of integration framework um, could be and should be a useful framework for all local authorities to use um, in partnership with their, um, with their um, the other agencies that they work with. I mean, it talks about 14 domains um, which are core to integration. So if you're achieving in all of these <coughs> domains, then you're, you know, you're moving along that positive matrix to achieving better integration. Um, it's not rigid. Um, it has, you can sort of use it to reflect your community. So some things will be more important for you in Wisbeach than it would be in Thetford, which would, would be in Great Yarmouth. So you can, um, you can mix and match. It helps us to look at integration more holistically. Um, a good example of this um, would be, for example, um, teaching English as a foreign language. Often we'll just measure the outputs, won't we? We'll just measure how many people came in and how many people left speaking English. But actually, this framework allows you to measure things like not only the number of people, but other data like um, the, you can ask for what social contacts they have made as a result of learning English. Their ability to navigate, for example, the health system, and more importantly, has it improved their ability to access employment? So this matrix or this framework allows you to do that. Using the framework in local areas is best practice and should be done in collaboration with other partners. Um, it's important because it can also let you set a baseline for all the relevant indicators and so we can not only measure the impact of the interventions and how our communities are changing but more importantly it can highlight those areas where we're not changing and therefore what are we going to do about it um, and ultimately it would be great to see that if lots of people are using this you could actually start to compare people so why is that area more successful in building integration um, than others because you could use something like this to help you. So in terms of the East of England, there are a number of um, regional initiatives to improve community cohesion. And I just wanted to really just feature a couple of them today. The first is the initiative, um, the Government Integration Communities Strategy. Um, Peterborough is one of five areas to receive government funding in this. Um, the city was se selected because it was um, because of the positive work it has done it to bring the, their communities together. And I would really commend to you um, looking on their website um, at the P Peterborough Together Partnership. They've actually gone around this in a really positive way. From my, um, you know, from from me looking at it from the outside where rather than, you know, they've actually um, invited people to put forward, you know, the best ideas in the community and they funded those. And so there's some fantastic examples there of the sort of initiatives that have been, um, you know, funded to support integration in Peterborough and they're now on to their second um, tranche of funding. And then in terms of um, the 
um, Controlling Migration Fund. That was launched in November 2016. And I have to actually read out what it says. It says it was set up to help local authorities mitigate the impact of recent migration on communities in their area. I wouldn't have chosen that wording, but that's the, you know, that is the uh, official um, wording. It's rather clumsy. But a number of authorities in the East have been successful in applying for and receiving funding, including Norfolk, Suffolk, Cambridgeshire, particularly Fenland, I'd like to point out, <laughs> seem to have made um, a major dent on the, fund, on the um, funding there. Um, I mean, a couple of examples I'm going to just talk about quickly. First of all, a, a great initiative in Hertfordshire, um, which really resonated with me because it's about an ESOL programme that's integrating learning English with learning about civic and cultural expectations. And that was born out of um, people noticing that a number of migrants, um, just as we saw in that lovely video that Jake did, um, were, um, were educated, they had qualifications, um, and that they'd come to this country, but they weren't able to use their qualifications um, because they didn't have the language skills in order to do that. And so the project was very much born out of um, a recognition of that. But also they noticed that um, they had that many of the migrants had uh, maybe a misunderstanding about British culture, like the role of the police, the tenants' rights, which we've heard about um, today. And so what they did, and I think, um, again, Anita might have referred to it, or certainly somebody referred to it, you know, taking people out to National Trust. Um, you know, there's probably no better example of <laughs> Middle England and the National Trust. Um, but it's about, I suppose, sharing with new communities what we think are precious as well, because that helps them see what makes us tick just as what we need to do is understand what makes them tick too so i thought it was a great example and then the other example before i finish is just it has to be from fenland doesn't it um because there was so much to choose from but again you know we we sometimes see it and recognize it but a lot of rough sleepers in the east of england are you know are um, migrants um and um, Fenland has focused on this um, and done a project um, and employs a full-time migrant outreach worker to deliver a holistic solution for migrants sleeping rough in Fenland. This includes ways of preventing homelessness by giving accommodation options, benefits advice, um, rent deposits, tackling illegal eviction and harassment. And they also provide coordinated advice and connections to other services. And they've had a lot of success. I mean, they're not big numbers, but actually you wouldn't expect it to be big numbers in Wisbeach or Chatteris or March because, you know, they are not big urban areas. But so far, um, when they did the case study, they'd, you know, 10 rough sleeping cases had been prevented, three reconnections achieved, nine clients engaged with mental health service, 62 with drug-related services, 61 with alcohol services, and 14 had accessed work. And I just think, again, if all councils were looking at rough sleeping from the point of view of the rough sleeper rather than the organisation and the institution, then we would have many more successful outcomes than that. So I just wanted to finish by saying, you know, why has, you know, Fenland been so successful in what it's done? Um, and why is it such a beacon um, to others? Well, I think it's a couple of things. Um, first of all, it's about um, the Rosmini Centre. It's about having something within the community that has built up to, um, with the community to tackle um, a particular need. But it's also due to sort of the leadership of Fenland Council, and more particularly in terms of David Bailey, who has actually, you know, I've worked with David for over 20 years, I think, probably. Um, you know, he was the traveller's officer to go to if you ever had a problem. And he has, you know, his passion and enthusiasm for supporting communities has, together with other partners, has made this 
conference happen and also um, the very successful research. We, need, we now need the East of England LGA. We now need to take this and we need to go to other parts of the East of England, particularly in Norfolk, I would argue, um, and ensure that the learning that is coming out of this work is actually replicated and um, picked up further afield. So um, thank you very much, everybody, for um, letting me speak today. And it's been a pleasure to be part of this conference. Thank you. Thank you.